And uh, that is our blessed hope, the hope of Israel, the messianic hope is the return of her Messiah. And I say return because we know he has been here. We know he didn't come as conquering king. He came as suffering servant. But one day, conquering king, and we can hardly wait. But we're a long ways from that in our parasha, in our study tonight. We are in Shemot, Exodus chapter 19. Um, actually, I think we start with 18 in the parasha, but 19 is where my focus will be more. Three months have passed since the parting of the Red Sea. During that time, God has fed them. Man, manna, manna has come from heaven. He's provided water. There's been the pillar of cloud by day. There's been the pillar of fire by night. The manifestations of the Lord have been all about them. There's order being established in their lives. We see them even um, allowing Moshe to be like a judge for them over the issues that they're having when they've camped. And I guess there'd be arguments between people and they would come to him for his wisdom. They're recognizing he is their leader. He is, in essence, the voice of, of God to them. And we're going to see him in that position. He's leading them now to Mount Sinai. I think you say Sinai, but same place. Now, Moshe, he's been here before. I've got to take you all the way back to Shemot chapter 3. That's the time when God called him out of the burning bush. In chapter 3 is called Horeb, H-O-R-E-B, in case if you're having trouble hearing over the Zoom, the mountain of God. That's how it's referred to in chapter 3, but Horeb and Mount Sinai or Sinai are considered the same uh, by, by most, by, I think most everybody. So where the blazing fire, the bush that was, would not be consumed in verse 2 of chapter 3, that got Moshe's attention. He saw that. He turned to look at it, and he thought, I've got to go see what this is about. It, it had his attention. But God held him back from coming right up and touching it. God stopped him and told him he was on holy ground to take off his sandals even because he was on holy ground. He identified himself as the God of Abraham, the God of Yitzhak, the God of Yaakov, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And when Moshe heard this, he hid his face because he didn't feel worthy to look at God. He, he was, realized what he was in the uh, presence of. But it's at this time that God commissioned him. Verse 12 in chapter 3, God said, Certainly I will be with you. And this shall be the sign to you that it is I who has sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God at this mountain. Well, if God is the one who's done these miracles, they're now out of Egypt. And that does tell Moshe that they were to come back to this mountain. If they're going to worship God there, he was to bring the children of Israel there. So God said he'd be back. And sure enough, in our parsha, as it opens up tonight, this is where they are. They're camping. They've stopped. The pillar has stopped moving, and they're camping. And they're literally camping. The name of the, the campground, Mountain of God. Well, how would you like to camp at Mountain of God? <laughs> I, I, that just would pique my interest. I think, ooh, this would be a great place to camp. And where do I get that? It is chapter 18. I'm backing you up to 18. Verse 5. Yitro, Jethro, Moshe's father-in-law, brought Moshe's sons and his wife to him in the desert where he was encamped at the mountain of God. So that's the name that the scripture gives. It doesn't say Horeb, doesn't say Sinai here, calls it the mountain of God. And you might say, well, where is this? Where are we on the map? Chapter 19, verses 1 and 2 make that clear. It says, in the third month after the people of Israel had left the land of Egypt, the same day they came to the Sinai Desert, or you may have the wilderness of Sinai. It, it's more like desert than what the world, word wilderness says to us, except that a wilderness is sparse. And that's the idea that, that we're getting. It wasn't fertile. It wasn't green grass and, and rivers of, of water everywhere. But after setting out from Rephidim, and arriving at the Sinai Desert, they set up camp in the desert. There in front of the mountain, Israel set up camp. 
So the camp is right in front of the mountain, the mountain of God. The, that's why we call it the campground, the mountain of God. We know now where we are. And Yitro has come uh, when Moshe was on the backside of the desert, as we call it, when he spent his 40 years isolated away from Pharaoh's court after he had fled for fear of losing his own life because he had killed the Egyptian. There is where he married, had two sons, and this is who the, his father-in-law, apparently when he went to be the representative to before Pharaoh, the family stayed back with the, his wife's father, and now they've been reunited. Um, we're going to see in this parasha, just for your interest if you haven't read it yet, that in time, the father-in-law, Yitro, he goes back to where he lives in the, um, the desert, but the children and the wife stay with Moshe from that point on. They just were not there in the midst of um, the fight that was going down, the showdown, I'll say, that was going down in Egypt, and they didn't um, experience the crossing of the Red Sea, but he had heard about it. And then yet when he came, Moshe filled him in on all the details of it. That must have been one exciting conversation. But as I mentioned in chapter 3, God had said this was holy ground. It was holy ground then, and it's holy ground now. In chapter 3, God had Moshe take his sandals off. We don't hear that here, but we are told that Moshe went up to God. He went up into the mountain. Remember, the people are camped at the base of the mountain. He went, started up into the mountain, and it says that God called to him from the mountain. And God told him, tell the people, tell the house of Yaakov, the house of Jacob, tell the sons of Israel, you saw what I did to the Egyptians. He's talking to them and reminding them, you saw it. Remember how they drowned in the Red Sea. You saw how I bore you on eagles' wings. I've brought you to myself. Now, he doesn't mean he literally sprouted wings, but the idea is as the eagle could fly, as they could get away, God brought them away and has brought them literally to where he is. This is where his presence is at this point. And God goes on to tell the, them through Moshe, now obey, keep my covenant, and you will be my possession. Among all the peoples on this earth, the whole earth is mine, but you'll be a peculiar people. You'll be a special people. You'll be a kingdom of priests. You'll be a holy nation. What an opportunity they were being offered that the God of creation, the God of it all, would bring them into this special relationship with him to represent him to the rest of the world. They had this opportunity. God was calling them to it. And when Moshe told the people, this is what God had said, their answer was wonderful. It's in verse 8 of chapter 19 of Shemot of Exodus. that They said, all the Lord has spoken, we will do. They had the right heart. They had the motivation. They were declaring, yes, we'll enter that covenant with God. He will make covenant with him. We will be his, his people. We will be his priests. We will represent him to the world. So their intent was good. We know it doesn't go that way necessarily, but right now, God told Moshe when he reported back that the people, what the people had said, he told Moshe, he says, in a thick cloud, I will speak to you so that the people will hear and they'll believe in you forever. God knows human nature, and he knew that in time they could start saying, well, who made you? leader Moshe and how do you know this is what God wants and how do, you, how do we know that you've really heard from God these are questions we ought to ask any of our leaders today we need to see does what they say line up with the word of God because there can be false prophets and false teachers among us but how would they know with Moshe because they didn't have the word of God to open up and compare they didn't have the Holy Spirit within to guide them that this is false or this is true so God's going to manifest himself because they can't see his glory and live he's going to be camouflaged in the thick smoke in the thick cloud but they will hear his voice they will hear him speaking to Moshe, and they'll know that God has 
directed through Moshe to be their leader, to, to speak to the people what they are to do. So they will hear God, but they won't see him. Now, that's a major step. You have to realize that these are people that for the last 400 years have been living in a land of idolatry where they've worshipped every god that, that they could possibly think up in their minds from the gnats and the flies to the, god, the sun god and, and everything else in between. But the one true and living God, he's the one who is bringing it to them now. Here is who you worship. Here is who you have relationship with. And verse 11 says that he came down in the sight of all the people. Again, not that they could see him, but in that thickness of the cloud, that the Shekhinah glory would have been camouflaged, but it would still be. You can tell when there's a light in the clouds. We've often seen a silver lined cloud or a cloud where the sun is behind trying to break through. You can see the difference. That's how it would have been. But he told the people, or he told Moshe to tell the people, for three days, in essence, get ready. Prepare yourself. Cleanse yourself. Get ready to hear the word of God. Now, it's very interesting, and here's where I want us to stop and pause and jump off. We've talked a little bit about third day in the past, but if you read in Shemot, in Exodus chapter 19, between verses 11 and 16, that's just five verses, you will see four times the third day is mentioned. Four different times. On the third day, on the third day, third day, third day. Concentrate yourself. Get prepared. So something is so important here that God keeps repeating to them. Don't look for it on the first day. Don't look for it on the second day. And don't not be ready on the third day because it's not going to be on the fourth. It's going to be on the third day. Now, I have to ask myself, okay, if God's going to all this trouble of drawing their attention to this third day, what is he trying to draw their attention to? In my mind, there's got to be something more than just it's the third day. It's just one, two, three. There has to be something more here. So when I question something like that, I look to Scripture to see if I can get an answer. So what do we see in scripture that would give us a hint, a clue, something about why God is, is meeting with them on the third day? Why isn't he meeting them the next day? Why isn't he meeting them on the fourth day? Why the third day? So I have to go back to the scriptures up to this point, and that's not much. I have the book of Bereshit, Genesis, and I have the beginning in Exodus, but that's all as far as we go. Do we see anything in that short portion? Well, I don't get out of the first chapter and the second chapter of Bereshit before I see third day. I see that it's the third day of creation. And I notice that on the completion, well, let me say first, what we know is God created and he created something specific and then we're told in the evening and the morning were the first day. And the evening and the morning were the second day. And we see this repeat for the whole week. What we also see is, and God saw that it was good. He says it on the first day, but he does not say it on the second day. He says it on the third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth. The, the second day is the only day that he does not say it. And it's very interesting on that third day, He's going to say it twice, almost as if he's saying it for the previous day and the next day. And because we don't have a God who forgets, it's not like he put in the footnote, oh, and it, God saw that it was good. But we look at those two days and we see that coming out of the second day, going into the third day, you have to have those two together to see the complete act. That dry land is what appears vegetation comes out of the dry land on the third day, but we have to see the separation of the waters on the second day to get dry land on the third day. So it's as if those two days is one longer completed act at the end of the third day, and that's why God didn't say it was good in the middle, but he said it was good when he had completed it. And we're going to see a bit more 
of something significant there as I go on, but uh, just keep that in your mind. Let me bring out to you that on the third day, when that dry land appears and the vegetation comes up out of the earth, that now we have plants yielding seeds and trees bearing fruit. That's chapter 1 of Bereshit, is verses 11 through 13, if you want to check me out. What we're seeing is this picturing new life. It's, it's picturing something that's sprouting, rising up from the ground, where in essence that was non-existent in their minds. It was um, dead underground. You can't see anything growing. But here comes something sprouting up out of the ground. And we could even go so far as to say that would be like a picture of first fruits. This was the first fruits of God's creation, something springing up into life. That's on the third day. Now, I realize then we count fourth day, fifth day, sixth day, but let me just make you realize that's another three days. Okay, so what happens on the second set of the third day? And on that one, which is our sixth day, but we'll say it's three days later. This is verse 24 now in Bereshit 1. We have that God creates the animal life and the human life. So we see on those two threes, the first third day of creation and the third, uh, the second set, the sixth day, but the second third, that God's bringing forth the living creatures. He's bringing forth everything that is alive, that reproduces, and so forth. Um, the, the living creatures were brought forth also. Um, I think I did say that, that the animals were, were created. Um, what, what was in the seas even was created on third day also. So what we have is life springing forth on those two times. And it is interesting to note that on the second set, that sixth day, that God formed humankind, that he brought them out of the dust of the ground. So just like we see the seed go into the ground and we see the sprout come out, God took the dust of the ground and formed man out of the dust of the ground. He's creating new life again out of the ground. On the third day we saw it, on the sixth day, the second, thir third, <laughs> we see it. And we can look at a little bit of connection between the trees and, and uh, um, the plants and the human life because both were newly created from the ground, as I said. We see, by the way, the human created out of the ground in chapter 2 of Bereshit, verses 7 and 9. And we saw that in, in chapter 1, the the trees and the plants were to bear seeds and to bear fruit, reproducing. We see that God made man to reproduce. We see, you know, similarity there. So both created in that way on that third day, but it's only the humans that God says were made in his image. And it's only that humankind that God is going to enter into covenant with. He's going to bless them. But he's going to also give them instruction. They're to follow and be obedient to their God. If you do all I do, then you'll be a nation for me, a priest. Then you will represent me to the world. So I think we can see um, a connection of, of the importance of third day and even of sixth day, but a second three in scripture. Let's go a little bit further. Let's get outside of creation on our way to where we are in, uh, after the Red Sea party. Do we have another third day in scripture in between those two? And actually we have at least a couple of them. We come first to Abraham, chapter 22 of Genesis, Abraham. When he was uh, told by God to take his one and only son and offer him as a sacrifice to God, testing of Abraham's faith. We see that, that he was to go to a certain place. God would let him know where that place was, but he was to set out. Do you know how long of a journey they were on together? You got it. Three days. On the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes, saw the place, knew God said, this is it. This is where. This is where you're to offer up Yitzhak. And by the way, it just happens to be on a mountain. I think God likes mountaintop experiences with his human beings. And of course, Abraham goes through the test, comes out.
For is he does not sacrifice Yitzhak. That was not God's intention to have him do it, but God had to show him his heart, and his heart was willing to sacrifice the very son of promise, his one and only son that everything hinged on. But as the book of Hebrews tells us later, Abraham believed in his heart that God would raise Isaac from the dead if he did sacrifice him because he, Abraham knew the promises had, would only come through Isaac, and they hadn't come yet. Isaac didn't have seed yet. So Abraham in his faith knew God would even bring him back to life. So again, we're seeing a third day significant with a, 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 what appears to be dead and brought to life in creation and now with Abraham with his son Isaac. And this is a son that God's made uh, or is making a covenant promise with. He's made the promise with Abraham, but he's also going to make it with Isaac. And we know he makes it also with Jacob with Yaakov and in Yaakov's life do we see a third day experience and I'll tell you yes we do anyone know what that is okay I'll tell you what we call Yaakov Jacob's ladder I think we should call it Yehovah's ladder I think is a misnomer to call it Jacob's <laughs> but people miss the fact Yaakov had to leave home. He had to flee because Esau, his brother, wants to kill him. He's so mad. He wants to kill him because he thinks his brother has tricked him out of what was rightfully his brother's, that birthright. But he doesn't see that ladder in vision in a night dream on the first night. He hadn't just set out. It was on the third night that he has that, that vision of Yehovah at the top of the ladder and he at the bottom, and the promises that Jehovah makes to him that, that encourages Yaakov that God is making covenant with him, promising that even though he's going out of the land of promise, God was going to bring him back safely. We know that when he awakened, he called the place Beit El, the house of God. He made an altar there. He said, you know, if, if God is faithful to his word, takes me out, brings me back, I will sacrifice to him. I will make tithe to him. And we see Yaakov follow that in his life. But it's interesting that that ladder, as we study it, and that was a whole other lesson, but as we studied it, we saw it was representative, representative to us of Yeshua, of the Messiah, and not just of him as conquering king, but seeing him in shedding his blood, that through his death, the way to heaven would be paved. Yaakov said, this is the gateway to heaven. This is, in essence, you open the gate here and go to heaven through here. He caught that. He understood the uh, coming up and down of the angels on the Son of Man is recorded for us in the Brichad Shah in, in Luke. I think it's Luke 6, if I remember right, but it's in Luke. That this was a picture of Yeshua, who bridges the gap from heaven to earth through his own death and resurrection. We have the way made home open and available to us. So again, we've got a third day. And we've got a picture of death and life coming out of death or nothing springing into life. So with those in mind, we come now to the third day at Mount Sinai, the mountain of God. And God saying, I'm ready to enter covenant with Israel. And again, it's on a mountaintop. Very interesting. The mountains seem to, to come into play in this way. God's going to come down on the Mount Sinai to be with the people, and this is a test for them. Are they going to prepare themselves? Are they going to be ready? Are they going to consecrate their hearts to God? Now, I also want to see, does the pattern follow? Is this just a start and we stop here, or does it follow? Because I'm seeing something very significant in this new life for the people. Each time it seems to be a new life for Abraham when it's as if Isaac was sacrificed and brought back to life. It was a new life for Yaakov. He's going to go out. He's going to get his bride through whom the, the promised seed will eventually come. And he's also going to be brought back with such a change in him that he's even going to have a name change. He's going to have a spiritual name 
the name Israel. Now we've got the people called Israel, and God saying, I want to enter covenant with you. You're going to enter into a special relationship with me. This, again, is a new life for the people. Remember, they've been slaves. They've been amidst idolatry. Are they going to consecrate themselves to the one true and living God, worship none others, be obedient to him, and be a representative of him to the, the nations? That's what's on the table. Now, Israel, we know, rebels. Israel, we know that there's a generation that's so full of unbelief, God lets them die off in the wilderness. But he brings up the generation behind them. He doesn't let Israel die off. He lets the older who were full of unbelief die off. But he brings up the younger generation, and he brings them into the promised land. But yet he even talks about them and says that he knew ahead of time they would break their covenant. He's, that God would still keep his sight. He would uphold it. It was unconditional in that sense, that it was to be joint. But God's saying, I'm going to be faithful even when Israel breaks the covenant. Let's keep looking for third day in scripture. And there are many, many. I am only pulling out a couple of examples for us. Let me take you into the book of 2 Kings. That's not real far from where we are, but it's a little down the line in time. We come to Hezekiah. This is chapter 20, and in verses 1 through 5, God basically tells Hezekiah, your number's up. You're going to die. Put your house in order. This is it. Well, Hezekiah, boo-hoos. I don't want to die. I want to live longer. I don't know why he wanted to. I think it's greater to go home, but anyway, that was where Hezekiah was at. He cried out and pleaded with God for more time, and God finally did say, okay, I will give you more time to live. On the third day, you'll be healed. Again, an interesting picture. You're not going to die. You're going to come back to life on the third day. Um, very interesting, I think. Then I go to the book of Esther, Hadassah. And when she knew that there was a, dec a declaration out for all of the Jewish people to be uh, annihilated, she's Jewish. Doesn't matter, she's the queen. Her blood's going to be spilled also. They're all going to die. It will be the end of the Jewish population. And it's se that serious Esther's got to go before the king and plead for her people, but she pauses and says, give me three days. For three days, fast and pray. Then on the third day, I will go before the king. And we know how this story goes. Esther and her people are not slaughtered and instead are allowed to defend themselves and that enemy goes down in defeat and the Jewish people are not only exonerated then, but they go on to continue to have children, and the line continues to go on down to Messiah. Well, let's go to Messiah. In his life, I find a three-day before the one that you're expecting. I find it, I hit the age of 12. I think you're all familiar with what happened when he was 12 years old. They had gone to the temple as a family for, uh, uh, I believe it was Pesach, Passover, for one of the three holy days anyway, but I believe it was. And the family had started back for home, which is Nazareth. And apparently Yosef thought Yeshua was with Miriam. Miriam thought Yeshua was with Yosef. And by the time they realized he wasn't with either of them, and they turned back to Jerusalem, they come to find him at the temple on the third day. And there he is confounding the scholars because he's opening their eyes to the scriptures in a way that is beyond a 12-year-old, but totally fitting, because he's the very author of those scriptures, and who knows them better than the author of them himself? But significant that he is opening their eyes and lightening them at a time when they're living in darkness, because at this point, Israel is sitting in darkness, and the prophet Yeshahu says that when they sat in darkness, they would see a great light, and we know the light was a, a symbol, symbolic picture also of Messiah, as we said, even when we lit the candles tonight, so interesting there. 
let me take it into what affects us and what we call the, the church, the called out assembly. And we know that our main um, founder, leader of the, the, the groups that are called churches today for just our understanding is Shaol turned to Paul. When he was Saul, he was persecuting the believers. He was the, the instigator to hunting them down. Men and women didn't matter to him which, getting them thrown in prison, getting them sentenced to death. We believe that the scripture even shows us that he was the one that brought Stephen up on charges, who was the first martyr for Yeshua's namesake, that it was Shaol Paul, Shaol at that time, not Paul yet, that, um, that had him stoned. He's off on another vendetta to take out some more Christians. He's on the road to Damascus. You know the story. God intervened. A light shone out of heaven. It basically knocked him off his high horse. <laughs> and when it's over, he's heard a voice out of heaven telling him that you're kicking against me. You're, you're coming against very God himself. And there's a sudden change that's taking place within his heart. But when that little scene, that short time is over, Shaul is blind. It's a picture of death. He can't see. And he's led by the hand into Damascus, into the street called Straight, to stay at a house where he's going to be until Ananias comes, touches him, and his sight is restored. Guess when the sight's restored? Third day. Is this not an interesting pattern? Again, and what new life Shaul Paul came into that even changed his name from Saul to Paul? And he goes on and, and where he tried to persecute and kill off the believers, he becomes their greatest leader and gives his own life in martyrdom before, um, in time, I should just say in time. So we see a running picture through scripture of third day showing us a death, a resurrection, an old life, a new life, a significant change. And that's my second point of what's significant about third day. God said that he gave days and seasons and times to be a significant factor, to point to something of importance. So I think it's, it's noteworthy to look at these things because they are to be signs for us. Signs of something significant, something important. In Yeshua's life, he's grown up into adulthood. We have the episode of him sharing in the temple when he was 12, but we don't have anything else said until we get to his very first miracle. His first miracle is the wedding at Cana of, of the Galilee, Cana of Galilee. And that wedding is taking place on the third day of the week. Now, it's also um, common in Israel to this day for weddings to take place on the third day. Because do you remember when I said all the way back at creation that God twice on the third day said that it was good? He, in essence, blessed the third day twice. And so the, the Orthodox especially choose to get married on the day that has God's double blessing, that that might be what will come into their newly married life. So third day, wedding day, typical in Yeshua's day, I believe typical all the way back, and still happens today. I've seen weddings in Israel, and so have others on the third day of the week when you're there. Because remember, Israel goes by, they, they don't call their days of the week Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. They call them day one, day two, day three. They're very well aware, and their count is to tell them where they are in relation to Shabbat. That's always where they start the count again. Right after Shabbat sundown is day one, the start. Because remember, evening and morning are the next day. So here we go. We've got a significant third day, a third day event. Does it tie into Mount Sinai? I don't want to get so far away that we forget we're starting here at third day on Mount Sinai. Well, I have to say, even when we remember that, we've got to realize in scripture, there is more than one meaning. There is more depth. It's like a diamond. When you have a diamond, you look at it and the light hits it and you see beautiful ruby red color. 
Then you look at it from another angle and you see a blue, sapphire blue that's just gorgeous. Then you can look from another angle and see a green, a gold. You know what I'm saying? The, and the way that the diamond is cut can bring out the, the, the colors all the more. Well, this is what the Word of God does. When we look at it at one angle, we see. We've bypassed third days and not noticed them. Now we're seeing, oh, there's a new color here. There's a new angle. There's some more meaning here, something. And always, it will reveal to us the character of our God. It will reveal to us his magnanimous plan. It tells me that this book is not just a book written by man. How could man do this? How could man take it from creation and take it all the way through and have these significant things come out that we're seeing and do this on multi-levels with multi-symbols continually? How can he take, what, over 40 men, um, over 1,500 years, all the different walks of life, all the different backgrounds, not at the same time, so they're not talking and deciding what they're going to say together, and weave through Scripture so that it never uh, contradicts each other, and it can allow this depth to come out. This is amazing. This isn't just literature. This is a living word of our God. This shows me the miraculous power of our God. No one is equal to this. I don't care. The most brilliant playwright can never get to the level what God has done with his word and gifted it to us. Oh, my. How amazing. And yet people will leave that sitting on the shelf. Pick it up. It's a treasure. Get into it and dig out the gold. Dig out the silver. Dig out the rubies. Dig out the gems. It's there for us. Let me bring us back before I get off on my soapbox. Let me bring us back to that wedding. There's going to be a sign here, something significant, okay? Then what happens at the wedding? If you know the story, you know that Yeshua turns the water into wine. Well, wine is a symbol of God's bounty. We say that every time we do the, do the Kiddush at the end of our Shabbat services. We drink the wine and we say that, that we're blessing God, who is the one who brings forth the fruit of the vine. And we also know in Scripture that it's a picture of, the, of uh, spiritual joy. Even some say, and I understand it, that it's symbolic of the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh. Because when you have scriptures that say, and this is in Mattathayu in the Brit Chadashah, chapter 9, um, verse 17, that you can't put new wine into old wineskins. We know that he's speaking about the new covenant, the new belief can't go into the law. The law can't hold it. It can't contain it. It bursts. There's something new here. And Ephesians 5.18 even makes it all the more clear. It says, don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Ruach HaKodesh, with the Holy Spirit. So we've got the symbol of the Holy Spirit here. We've got the symbol of spiritual joy, not just wedding joy, but a spiritual level of joy, God's bounty, God's provision. Interesting. Let me give you just a little detail of the wedding. I won't go into all of this. I've done it before, but just to remind us, the wedding probably was somebody in the priestly line. The fact that they had stone jars that were what the water was in that was changed to wine. The homes had clay. The, the priestly line, or the more, um, some wealthy also, but not just, let me just put it this way. I'll say the average Joe or the average Joseph, <laughs> they would have clay. And the fact that this was stone shows that it probably in the proximity where the house was and all, it probably was somebody in the priestly family. Now, when we know that Yeshua is our high priest, we're seeing something happening here. And that's already been introduced to the people in the sense that in chapter 1 of Yochanan of John, we have that the word became flesh and tabernacled with us. We see that, that very shortly, the Lord is going to refer to himself as the temple. That it would be in three days, it would be destroyed, but it would rise up again. Notice another three day in there. 
So when we're looking at the tabernacle, we're looking at the temple, we're looking at where, and, and by the way, it's John who's giving us this story. So he's given us this background. We can see that, that it's foreshadowing Yeshua as our high priest. And we see that um, he confronted the Judeans, the people living at that time, because they had said to him, well, what sign are you doing? What can you do to show us that you are who you say you are? You see, he had just overturned the, the tables in the temple. He had set out those who were making money because he said, you, you know, this is to be a house of prayer, and you're turning it into a den of iniquity. And they were after him, like, why do you have the right to call us out? Well, if he's the high priest, if this is his temple, he has a right to cleanse it. And so he's showing them that in this symbolism that's going on, that he is doing the work of the high priest. This is his right. It is who he is. And at the same time, while he's not only high priest, he's going to take on the role that it typically would be the bridegroom's responsibility at this wedding. And that is that the bridegroom saw to the wine that would be at this the ceremony. And you need to understand their weddings lasted, or their celebrations lasted a week. It's the wedding week. So it wasn't that they had to have just enough wine for, a, 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 um, what do we call it afterwards, a reception. But they needed it, you know, for the week long. So all of a sudden, when Yeshua's changed the water into wine, Usually what they would do is they bring out the very best at first. Then as the people would be a little tipsy, they'll bring out what isn't quite as good quality because nobody will notice it while they're a little under the influence. They'll still be having a good time and thinking it's great. So it was a way to help save on the expense. But Yeshua's wine was the best because he's the creator. So when he turned the water into wine, he didn't turn it into the cheap dollar version. He turned it into the best that many could buy. It was the best wine. And the head waiter, the one that would be giving out the wine to everyone who had obviously knew there had been a problem and now there was enough, he immediately called to the bridegroom and he says, What gives? You held out. You waited to, to bring out the best stuff until now. Why did you do it that way? So it shows the responsibility was with the bridegroom. That's why the head waiter went to the bridegroom to say, what's going on? And Yeshua was showing himself now. He was taking that responsibility. So we're seeing him in this wedding ceremony as our high priest and as our bridegroom. Very interesting. And Yochanan, John, uh, go ahead, goes ahead and confirms that in chapter 3 and verse 29. He refers to himself as the friend of the bridegroom. And he says that the friend has to diminish. The bridegroom is the one who has to increase. This is the one who the eyes have to go on. So when some of Yochanan's followers were leaving Yochanan to follow Yeshua, they were saying, aren't you upset about that, John? And he's saying, no, that's what has to happen. He's the one. Put your eyes on him. So in this wedding, we're seeing the bridegroom. We're seeing the miracle of manifesting the glory of our God and proving who he is. And that's why in chapter 2 of John, verse 11, it says, this is the first of Yeshua's miraculous signs. He did it at Cana in the Galil. He manifested his kavod, his glory, his shachina glory. And his talmudim, his followers, came to trust or came to believe in him. They were catching it. In our Orthodox Jewish Bible, it goes so far as to say, just the beginning of the verse, but I love it. The fir this, the first rashit, the first, the beginning of the miraculous signs of Yeshua Rabbi Melech HaMashiach. What's that saying? It's the first miraculous signs of the rabbi who is King Messiah, and his name is Yeshua. That's right there given in living color in, uh, in the Orthodox um, translation. Amazing. 
that what they're seeing is that man cannot produce anything. God out of death brings life. Yeshua as our high priest is going to bring forth the fruit of life. He is symbolized by the wine being the, the symbol of the Spirit of God. He is showing God's glory. The miracle revealed his glory. This proving who he is because only one from God can do what you've done. That's what Nicodemus said to him when he came to him at, at night. And what we're going to see is the law that Moshe has been given, that the people are going to commit to, is not going to bring life. It's going to bring death, the sentence of death. They can't be held on charges for breaking the law where there is no law. But now with the law, they are going to be condemned because no one can keep the law. And the scriptures tell us if you break even one law, you're guilty of it all. So Yeshua is showing that he is going to be the one who brings life out of death once again. All of these roles being seen in this miracle and to prove it, the cherry on top with it is when when Yeshua was approached to do something about the problem, he said to his mother, my hour has not yet come. What's he referring to? We all know he's referring to the purpose why he came. The purpose why he came was to die. To die on that cross, to shed his innocent blood in our place, and of course, not to stop short, but to come back to life. Do we see that in this also? And I will take you right to the wine. That the wine is a picture of his precious blood poured out for the remission of sins. What am I referring to? Go with me in your minds to Passover. Go with me to the third cup of redemption. To the cup that, that says, I will redeem you with an outstretched arm. That's Shemot Exodus 6 verse 6. And then let me take you to Mattathiah, to Matthew's recorded words in the Brit Chadashah. In that ceremony, as Passover was going on, Luke lets us know it was the third cup. Chapter 26 of Matthew, verse 27 says, Also he, Messiah, Yeshua Jesus, he took a cup of wine. He made the brucha. He said the blessing, just like we do. And he gave it to them, to his Talmudim, saying, All of you. Drink from it, for this is my blood, which ratifies the new covenant, my blood shed on behalf of many, so that they may have their sins forgiven. Wow. Do we have the whole picture? The water turned to wine to be a picture of his blood being shed to bring us new life on third day. Amazing. And oh, by the way, he will accomplish that on another mountaintop. It's called Golgotha. <clears throat> Interesting, once again, Golgotha is part of the Moriah range. The Moriah range is the same range where Abraham had the near offering of Yitzhak. And as I mentioned, this is a wedding. Through his shed blood, one day we will have the wedding feast of the Lamb. And guess what? That comes on the third day. Hold on, and I'll explain what I mean on that in just a bit. But as we put all this together, we're seeing three reasons for our third day. It's all about death and resurrection. It was planned before the foundations of the world because we have it in the first day of creation. It was a sign showing us that this is something significant, that there's something being portrayed far beyond just, hey, it's day three. And we're seeing that every focal point, and it happens to be the central focal point of the complete scriptures, it's always, always about the death, burial, and resurrection of Yeshua. That's what it's about from Bereshit to Revelation. That's the crux of it all. And we're seeing it all the way through. And then we see in the sign, in this complexity, in the fact, again, as I said, the, it was, the Word of God was written over 1,500 years by 40 authors, all these backgrounds. We are being shown this is God. It's God breathed, it's God written, it's God inspired, it's the, the living literary picture to illustrate to us that Yeshua came to redeem mankind. And I say, hallelujah, it's all about him and he did it all. 
Well, what about the third day of receiving the law? This is a climatic moment. It is showing divine activity. It's showing a very pivotal point where God's going to deliver his law to those he has redeemed. He redeemed them when he brought them out of Egypt. The greater redemption comes for their soul. But this third day, it's no wonder the manifestations on this mountain were so great. Why the earthquake? Why the lightning? Why the mountain shaking? Why the, the shout of the, the voice of God, the shofar blowing? Why so much? It was so fearful. It, it, it shook the people to their core. Why? Because we need to see how great this God is. This isn't something that, that somebody just can put together. This is showing us how great our God is. Remember, Yeshua did the miracles to show he's the one who came from God. He's the one promised. He's the one who would redeem. He's showing it by his power. And every time when God is entering into covenant relationship with his people, it is earth shattering. I'll put it that way. Even though this law is going to condemn them to death, speak to them of death, Yeshua is going to come and fulfill that law. He didn't come to break the law. He came to keep it. He came to fulfill it. He came to bring us life out of his resurrection <coughs> through it. But this is the manifestation of God, and Yeshua brings it home for us in, in, in redemption. So the law will point to Yeshua. It will point to, it's like a schoolmaster pointing to the school child that you're not measuring up. That's why teachers test the children. It's not to make the children feel bad, but it's to show them where they're failing, where they need to correct or learn or grow. And we know that, that the, the law was to point them to the fact all have come short of that glory of our God manifested in Yeshua that's been shown to us and is repeatedly shown. So we see in this, again, we see that the law cannot save, but it brings them the one who can save, the one who will bring life out of death, the one who will be the seed bringing forth life. Remember, the seed has to go into the ground. It has to, in essence, die in that ground to, to break and sprout and spring forth into newness of life. And day three, we have out of the dry ground, the root out of dry ground. Hmm, that sounds like Yeshua Isaiah 11 and verse 1, the, that would spring forth out of the stump of Jesse. It sounds like Isaiah Yeshua chapter 53, the first part, the last part of the first verse and into the second verse. To, him, to whom is the arm of Adonai revealed? For before him he grew up like a young plant, like a root out of dry ground. Why did the life of the, the plants and trees spring forth on the third day? Because it's picturing the life that Yeshua bring us out of death on that third day. So when we sum it up, I think we have a beautiful picture of third day it's salvation. It's Yeshua. It's his atoning work. It's a climatic point, the, the crescendo, the, the, the whole enchilada brought together through divine activity. It's Yeshua who does it. It's God who does it. Well, I can't leave you on Mount Sinai. I can't leave you in Shemot. I've got to take you in relation to Israel. We've looked at some of the others, but I've got to take you all the way through because there's a teaching out there called Replacement Theology that some of you may be very familiar with. And it, in, in simple sentences, it says that Israel blew it. She did not receive her Messiah. So God said, done, kicked her out, and brought in that church, that ecclesia, to take Israel's place. Is that what happened? And I'll tell you, no, and it never will. God said all the way back, he knew Israel would be rebellious. He knew Israel would fail. That he would remain faithful. And God told Yeshua, Isaiah, that they will hear, but they won't, that, that they would hear, but not understand it. That they would see, but they wouldn't see it. 
that in other words it'd be right there but they'd miss it they'd hear it but they wouldn't hear it God told them that it would be like that and he even described them as he, he as he, they are his wife and in God's book there is no room for divorce never does God say divorce is the right thing so when rebellious Israel acts like a wife that goes off into adultery God stays faithful and he doesn't throw his wife away let me give you a couple other examples real quick when we look at Jonah Jonah he has a three-day tale for us also he fails to be obedient to Yahweh he experiences death his his tomb is a little strange it's the belly of a fish it's not on land but it's the belly of the fish and that God uses a picture to symbolize Israel's failure as a nation Yonah failed to be obedient to God he was to go with the Word of God and represent to the Ninevites and he didn't Israel was to take the Word of God to represent to the nations and she didn't did God give up on Yonah no no Yonah gets a whole new life and guess when it happens <laughs> third day <laughs> once again we have the life coming out of the death on the third day that fish threw him up got rid of him didn't want that stomach ache <laughs> and Yonah had a new life and went and did what he was supposed to do in our Haftor portion for this week it's very interesting that while we're studying this third day that we're given to read Isaiah again chapter 6 verses 1 through 7 um, and, and actually sorry chapter 6 verse 1 through chapter 7 verse 6 okay if you've got the Torah portions it has it on there for you so we're going to read um, from the beginning of chapter 6 halfway through chapter 7 and then they skip and they have them read to chapter 9 verses 5 and 6 um, let me just read to you a couple verses out of there in chapter 6 verses 8 and 9 Adonai asks a question it says that I heard the voice of Adonai saying this is Isaiah he heard the voice of the Lord saying whom should I send who will go for us yet Isaiah answered I'm here send me you know what he said in Hebrew Hineni Hineni I'm here send me and Adonai said go and tell this people very interesting that this is what they're reading yet that's where Adonai goes on and says that the people will hear and not understand and they'll see but they won't perceive it even so Isaiah asked well how long do I do this and how far do I go and God told him you go to, through all the cities you go until there aren't any more cities until they are devastated and the people are not living in the cities anymore and the land is laid desolate because they were going to go off into captivity and God said you you preach it to them until they're gone you don't ever quit God is preaching to Israel she won't be uh, sent out into captivity that she will not come back from we know that God has promised a great coming back and we're beginning to see we see the first fruits of that but even when God told Isaiah it's going to be desolate he also said one other very key phrase in verse 13 of chapter 6 and that is he said the holy seed and that's H-O-L-Y the holy seed is its stump you know what a stump is you cut down a tree you've got the stump there God was saying Israel's being cut down she's going into captivity the land's going to be denuded but it's not over what looks dead out of that stump is going to come life it's going to come Messiah he is the one who's going to come the Holy Seed would be the child that would be born the son that would be given very interesting that our Jewish people who hesitate to believe this is speaking of Messiah choose these verses to put together they even skip in the middle there they don't read chapter 8 but they put chapter 9 together with these verses that I've read to you from chapter 6 and in chapter 9 
we get the description. The son that's given, the government, would rest on his shoulders. He would be the head of the nation and that this would be on the shoulders. That's the place of strength. That's the place that, that upholds. And then the descriptive names that are given, we know can only be the names of God. They're the names you're familiar with from usually our, our Christmas time. But they, I'll, I'll go through the names actually very shortly. But, but right now, just quickly, Wonderful Counselor, uh, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And when you look at these names, no man could fill these. This is significant that it's God and God alone. So they're putting this together. They're seeing that God is saying, even out of Israel's going off into captivity, the holy seed will spring forward. There will be new life. And even though the law condemns, the Hathor is showing life coming out of death, root out of dry ground. Hmm. Do I see day three again? Do I see the picture again? You know, it's not just a random day. God is setting a pattern. He's setting a pattern that shows new life and shows covenant, um, coming together in covenant with humanity. And we see that God, in the form of Yeshua, was resurrected out of the ground. He went into the tomb. He comes out in that new, resurrected, abundant life that in the new covenant he gives to all who would believe. And that resurrection came on the third day, the life out of death. And by the way, oh, Yeshua's atonement was on a mountain too. Very interesting. Third day, climatic day, God's plan for new life, God showing his faithfulness to his covenant, God showing he's been playing it out since creation, the finale, the future resurrection, Yeshua's followers, and the restoration of creation all seen on third day. Because we haven't hit it yet, and I don't know when I started, I don't know if I'm getting too long for you, but let me just go a little bit further if you'll bear with me. God promised to the prophet Yermia that he'd never make a full end of Israel. He'd make a new covenant. He would not make one like they broke when he says, I was a husband to them, but they broke my covenant. He says he'd make a new one. And he gave this also to our prophet Hosea. And Hosea is very interesting because Hosea was told to take the, his wife back again and again when she went out and was unfaithful. He was to bring her back because God was using that as a picture of what he was doing with Israel. And he, Hosea called Israel to return to her God. It, it says in our scriptures, return to Yahweh. This is chapter 6 in Hosea, verses 1 and 2. Prophetic language. And nobody argues that that's not talking about repenting toward the covenant, being faithful to the covenant, and that in that would be offered the hope of that resurrection. So Hosea 6 says, Come, let us return to Adonai, for he has torn and he will heal us. He has struck and he will bind our wounds. After two days he will revive us. On the third day he will raise us up. And we will live in his presence. Let us know, let us strive to know Adonai. Then he will come as certain as morning. He will come to us like the rain, like the spring rains that water the earth. Did you notice when does he raise them up? Third day. And you know, when we read in scripture, a day with the Lord is like a thousand years. A thousand years like a day. Tehillim Psalm 90 verse 4 says that. For a thousand years in your sight, are like yesterday when it passes by, or a watch in the night. Second Peter 3 and 8, But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years, a thousand years like one day. When we return to the covenant meaning to that life, that resurrection that's pointing to that life, when we see who is that life and that is Yeshua, then we have to say, okay, then when Yeshua? When will it happen? And the Lord told us, on the third day. That third day that we've been seeing all this play, two days have passed, 2,000 years have passed. The third day is beginning to dawn. 
and I say to Israel, your redemption draws nigh. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. But it's not just to Israel. It's to all of us who are hearing the voice of the Lord today. We are invited to the mountain of God. We are invited not to Mount Sinai. We're invited to Mount Zion. Mount Zion. And this is one that God doesn't say, don't come near. But he says, come near. Draw near. And so as I wind up in closing, I want to read to you from Hebrews chapter 12, which compares these two mountains. And I'm starting with verse 18. For you've not come to a tangible mountain, to an ignited fire, to darkness, to murk, to a whirlwind, to the sound of the shofar, to a voice whose words made the hearers bad, that they no, no further message be given to them, for they couldn't bear what was being commanded of them, that if even an animal touched the mountain, it was to be stoned to death. It was so terrifying, the sight that Moshe said, I'm quaking with dread. On the contrary, that's not where you've come. You've come to Mount Zion. You've come to the city of the living God. You've come to the heavenly Jerusalem, and here's its description. Myriads of angels in festive assembly. The angels are celebrating. You're coming to a community of the firstborn. God doesn't have grandchildren, but the firstborn whose names have been recorded in heaven, they're there. You're coming to a judge who is God of everyone, God being the righteous judge to the spirits of righteous people who have been brought to the goal. Those who have finished their course, Paul said he had almost finished the course. He fought the good fight. There was laid up for him a reward in heaven. Those who we've known that have had this faith, that have gone before us, they've reached that goal. That's who's there. That's what's being described. They're there with the midst of the angels celebrating. They're there with the others who have received and are firstborn with God. They've come to the new I'm sorry, to the mediator of the new covenant. Remember when we said Yeshua is our high priest? He's the one mediating. And it says the mediator of the new covenant, Yeshua, to the sprinkled blood that speaks of better things than that of Haval. When Abel's blood was shed, he was innocent. But this blood of the innocent Messiah was even greater because being sinless blood, it could take away the sin of the world. And then... It, it's brought home. The next phrase is, see that you don't reject the one speaking. Don't reject Messiah. Don't reject the one who is calling you to come to Mount Zion, who is calling you to come into his presence, to come through the shed blood of Yeshua, the high priest, and the one who will be your bridegroom. It goes on and it says that, that there is a warning coming that the earth will shake again, and not just the earth, but the heavens will shake. And in that phrase saying it's going to happen one more time, we know that's coming in tribulation days when heaven and earth will shake with the wrath of God. But it's saying again uh, in verse 28, Therefore, since we have received an unshakable kingdom, let us have grace through which we may offer service that will please God with reverence and fear. So we don't come to Mount um, Sinai and be told stay back and see manifestations that scare us. We're told when everything's shaking, we're coming through, we're coming to an unshakable kingdom. We're coming to the unshakable mountain. We're coming to where God is a consuming fire and he does judge, but he judges righteously. And when we look at our mountaintop experiences, we saw Mount Moriah where Abraham offered up or would have Isaac, and third day he gets Isaac back. Moses came to Mount Sinai and on the third day, the manifestations gave the people fear and spoke to them of death. If they touched the mountain, they would die. When we see Yeshua on Golgotha on the third day resurrecting, we see life come out of that death, and we see that he can give us that life. That's why he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. When we see that we, as the nation Israel, and as those who will come to faith and believe, being grafted into that same root, we come to Mount Zion, and here's where it's all summed up. On the third day, that third day that Hosea talked about, we come into kingdom life. We come into that life abundant. When it talks about that government filling the face of the earth, Isaiah 11 speaks of this about verse 9, I think. That kingdom is, is symbolic of a government. The government, the rulership of Messiah. 
That's what we're seeing that will fill the whole face of the earth. That millennial promise given to the son of David, the inheritance belongs to the son of David. Remember the root that would come out of dry ground? Remember the seed, that the holy seed? It is Yeshua. He was promised this kingdom. Remember our Hoth Torah that I raced through? That they pick up those verses in chapter 9, verses 5 and 6. And in 6, we get that description. The one who is to be head ruler, who will have this kingdom, this promise on earth on the third day, what we're coming into soon on our calendar, this is the one called Peli. That's the name that, that personifies to us, the angel of the Lord. He's called Yoetz and El Gabor. He's the holy, the mighty one of Israel. That can only be Yeshua and him alone. He is Aviat, the father of eternity. Even though the child was born, the son comes from eternity. He wasn't born. He always existed. And Sar Shalom, he is the prince of peace. A messianic title describing son of God, who is son of David, the child born, the son given, and no man can fill those shoes. It's Yeshua and him alone. And he is the one saying through his shed blood and his resurrection on third day, come, come into my mountain, Mount Zion. And we read in Isaiah chapter 2, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord and worship him there. And it says in the last days, the mountain of Adonai's house will be established as the most important, the chief mountain. So here's your, your mountaintop, the highest of highest. It is higher than what Ruth has climbed, and she's climbed the highest. <laughs> this mountaintop, it will be regarded more highly than the other hills, and all the nations will stream there. Many people will say, come and say, come, let's go up to the mountain of Adonai, to the house of the God of Jacob, of Yaakov. He will teach about his ways, we will walk in his paths, for out of Zion will go forth the law and the word of Adonai from Yerushalayim. Do you see how third day brings it all home? And the promise is coming. Israel, coming into that third day, will finally see and know her Messiah, who is coming to Mount Zion to set up his kingdom, and all come in. How? By earning it? No. You come in by faith, by believing in the resurrection and the abundant life of Yeshua to wash away our sin and make us right before God so we can come in and serve Him in that position. And in that millennial kingdom, we will see Him at the wedding feast of the Lamb. We'll have a great feast with Him. And then we have our eternal home in heaven forever. Is third day not amazing? It's no wonder that God said it four times in Exodus here in our, our parsha in chapter 19. Don't miss the third day. And as it's drawing clear, drawing nigh very quickly, make sure you have a heart that's ready. Don't miss it like Israel missed her Messiah the first time. Have a heart that's open, that receives. And when you have Messiah in your life, you have a seat at that wedding feast. Hallelujah. So I hope you're blessed. I am so excited to see how in just one phrase, look what we get throughout all of scripture. Isn't God amazing? Infinite, above and beyond what we can think. Oh my goodness, he is ineffable. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'll close us off in prayer. I'll open up the mics. I hope I wasn't so long that it was too hard on you to absorb, but may the Lord bless it to your heart like he has to mine. Lord God, we thank you for the mountaintop experience. We thank you that we can come to the mountain that does not tell us to stay back and to not touch and to be fearful of, of, of all that manifestation that you've paved the way by your shed blood so we can come up into the mountain of our God. We can worship you there. We can fellowship with you there. We can sit and have a feast with you there. And we can know that this is our eternal home, not just what's seen on earth, but in heaven, in your throne room there with you forever because we have come to the place where those who've gone before us 
are there, those that, that are described as you gave it to us, Lord, even the angels rejoicing, and we thank you that this is our sure promise through your shed blood that it's only unbelief that kept out Israel, but through her finally believing, she'll come in. And Lord, we pray, any who hear this message will open their hearts to receive you as Messiah, as Savior, that they too might come to the mountain of our God and come into knowing your ways because you are there with us, teaching, showing, and leading us. And we praise you forever for making the way possible through your death, burial, and resurrection on the third day. Hallelujah. Amazing grace and amazing is your word of God. It's, it, it's, there's no end to how deep it is, Lord, but take us deeper and let us be even more enriched by the nuggets we're finding in your very word of love to us. In the name of our precious Yeshua Jesus, our Messiah and Savior. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> we'll open the mics.